you're getting close to five minutes, try to wrap it up. So in Guatemala, I don't know if a lot of you know, but there are witch doctors, and not sure really what they are, but they're people that, mostly men who are leaders in the village, and they are obviously not Christian. Some are even leaders in the Catholic Church or something, and some think they're Christians, but they're very evil people, and they will, they perform, like, they say they're like medicine men, and they'll do stuff like give, like, there was one girl who had a hole in the bottom of her foot, and the witch doctor charged a lot of money to heal it, so what he did, he put mud in it, what he said was special mud, right? And ended up getting infected, and they had their hands straight and stuff, so, uh, there was one that was a pastor of a church, and my dad was going to, to talk at this church, and the, the witch doctor was there, and he was very rude to my dad, and you know, you just didn't want him to speak, but then he finally gave my dad a chance to say something, but threatened my dad that if he talked about God, that he would like kill him, he threatened his life. And my dad stood up and told him that he wasn't afraid of him, that like God was gonna protect him, and that he pretty much just told the whole church that who God is and stuff, and he really shared the gospel, and I thought that was awesome. So that's my dad. Um, my dad, I know a lot of you are probably going to talk about your parents. And I was going to do someone else, but luckily I go first, so I get to pick up. <laughs> <laughs> so, but my dad, when he was in his late 20s, he was diagnosed with MD, which is muscular dystrophy. It attacks the muscles in your legs, mostly for him, but anywhere else as well. So he has a very hard time walking, and he's been getting progressively worse. So he has to wear like these braces on his legs and like he uses a cane and stuff. And so doctors told me he should probably never have kids because his kids would have it and that he would be in a wheelchair within five years. So by he was by the time he was thirty three he'd be in a wheelchair. Well my dad's fifty five now and he's still walking mm -hmm. and he's still going to villages, hiking to difficult places and going to visit people and share the gospel with them. And so my dad, you know, we obviously had kids, there were four of us, and none of us had it, not yet at least. And so it was a blessing. We really showed the doctors what they know. Um, my dad taught me a lot about like, perseverance and like, dedication, because he's so dedicated to his job and to sharing the gospel with people. I mean, obviously, he doesn't give up easy, because it's easy to, to say that you can't do something, right? Especially when you're tired or like he is, he's so weak. And it'd be so easy for him to say that he can't go to people's houses or he can't go hike to this place, but he always is willing to try. There have been times we've had to get three men to help him, and I've always been one of them. We have to pull him up the mountain and stuff, but he's always doing it. So he's taught me a lot about not giving up and not saying no when you just feel like saying no. So he really inspired me that way. And um, when, I think it was last year at one point, he was having some really bad problems with his knee. So we had to come back to the U.S. on medical leave. And all the doctors here in the U.S. told him that he shouldn't go back. And that, like, this would be a great opportunity, he said, for him to just come back to the U.S. and relax and enjoy a normal life, they said. But, and they never found out what was wrong with his knee. But my dad, being very stubborn, decided to go back anyways. And he's having a lot of health problems still, but he's still doing the work. Um, I think, that's, like I said, that's taught me a lot. I think we can all learn from that. That, like, it's, like I said, it's easy to say no and just give up on stuff. But I think my dad gives so much of him when he has a legitimate excuse to not be overseas and stuff. So I think we should all learn from that. And I think we all have more to give than what we actually give. Thank you.
And so it was like, it was really hard transition because I was coming in the middle, I like didn't know anyone, and I came from like a 3,000 college to having, being one out of 500 in like a classroom. So I was like, it was really big. The first day I like cried because I was so lost. <laughs> and after that it just kind of dwindled down. I was having really emotionally like problems, just like one thing after another was happening. Um, my, we are paying, my roommate, I got like random roommates and the, we were paying her for like electric and like all that stuff and she, we were paying her and she also would come home one day and the electric's off and it was like off for three days, we are like trying to contact her, she was not there, finally like the landlord would be like contact her and she was just like well that's not our problem, like you have to talk to her about it. So I'm like stressing out because I'm like, I need a shower, I need to flush the toilet, like I need like I have stuff to do and like it's dark and it's cold. So finally like we got it back on, but then okay, so that was that. Then um, my I was visiting some friends at lunch for college and I walk out and I have like a flat tire and my car's not starting. So then I was like, oh my gosh, really? Like already something else. Um, so the tow truck comes and like in this little parking lot gets my car out and like he like he calls me he's like oh you didn't have any gas so I put money under your gas like in your seat and I was like great he thinks I'm like can't afford gas now like <laughs> I was just like great my life and then um, then like a week later my boyfriend broke up with me so I was like oh my gosh like this is just another thing like that could go wrong um, and then after that my um, Car, I was like driving home from school one day and my car started smoking and I was like, what am I gonna do? Like I don't know anything, I didn't even know how to like pump tire, like get like like air your tire. Like I knew nothing about cars. So I'm like I'm like pulled over to the side, I'm like sitting there like calling my dad and he's like, uh, we'll see if we can like start now, like and see if you can just at least make it home. I was like five minutes away. So I made it home and luckily I like, went to I got I made it to like a uh, where you get get your car. Car dealer, yeah, yeah, and um, they were like, oh yeah, you have like like leakage all over in your like engine, and I had no idea what they're talking about. I'm just like, okay, like just fix it, whatever. <laughs> but it took like um, like two days to do it because I had to like order all this stuff and everything. So I had a test the next day, and where I was living didn't have a bus or um, anything to get me. So I was like, had an email with my teacher saying like, is there any way I can make up the test? And he's like well, you have to come in like that day later if there's any way. So luckily I got, found a friend that like could drive me, but I was just like, just my luck. So after that I was like, oh, I just need to go home because my family is like very much, when I'm like under stress, it's like my safe haven. So I, it's six hour, hours away, so I'm like, I'm not even gonna tell anyone, I'm just driving home, I don't care, I'm done with like, I need a break from reality right now. So I started driving home and I call my mom and she's like, okay, yeah, definitely come home, that's fine. Like, you can, like, we'll have a good weekend. So then they surprised me and my one sister, the two older ones, um, lives in like Connecticut and Vegas. So, like, they're gone a lot, so they're not always home. But just so happens that they were visiting when I was coming home. So all the sisters were all together. I have two younger too. And so I just, like, as soon as I walked in the door, I just started, like, crying and they just were like, oh, everything's gonna be okay, like, it's fine, like, it, this is such a good school for you, like, you know, it's gonna be so much better, like, it's gonna get, it's gonna turn out to be okay, God has a plan. So, it just, like, literally, they just release all my stress, I guess, and they really help me to, like, look at life in the bigger perspective instead of just, like, all the little things that's going wrong. And so, um, they... So like my younger sister, they all like bring different things to the table. So my younger sister, she is the most wise person I know. She's like four, 16 and she acts like a 27 year old. She's just like totally like growing in her faith so much. And my two, my other younger sister and I always like go for her for like advice. We're like, you saw everything, like tell me. And, um, and then Becca, she's more like my partner in crime. So we always get in trouble. And then Michelle, she's, um, I went to lunch for college with her, so she was like an older sister. She wasn't like the mom, but she was like always making sure like I was going to church with her, like um, you know, just like having dinner and stuff. And my Nicole is the oldest, and she just is like the mother. So they just impacted me so much spiritually and emotionally, and just has had such a great impact on my life. And I would be here today if it wasn't for that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I bet your dad
dad sometimes goes, I wish there was a boy yeah. in the house. <laughs>
Okay, so basically, um, when my dad was 13, he began taking public transportation um, in, his, in his city. And we're from Northern Virginia. So um, he was on a bus one night um, to go to Springfield, Virginia. And um, the bus actually ended up taking him to Springfield, Massachusetts. Um, he, <laughs> he fell asleep and um, woke up um, to the bus driver telling him like, hey, like, you're still on my bus, like, I'm done for the night. And you can imagine, he was like so scared. Um, he was like, oh my gosh, what do I do? And the bus driver was like, hey, give me your watch. And so, I mean, any of us would be like, no, like I'm not gonna give you my watch. Um, but my dad gave him his watch um, and um, the bus driver allowed him to sleep on the bus overnight. And so the next morning, um, the bus driver returned um, his watch and came like with a little breakfast for him um, and was like, I'm gonna drive you home. Um, so the bus driver began his route by taking my dad back to Springfield, Virginia. Um, so basically, um, I told this story um, to shine light on my dad. Um, my dad is probably one of my best friends. Um, you know, I'm such a daddy's girl, but um, despite like my dad's professional role as a risk manager, um, he is such a natural born like problem solver. Um, and he always sees the best in people. Like, you know, one of us might be like, I'm not gonna give him my watch, like, um, you know, like, I'm not gonna, I can't sleep on this bus overnight, you know, but um, my dad really saw the best in the bus driver. And so that goes to show just that he sees the best in everyone. Like, for as long as I've known my dad, he just, um, he has like a lot of, um, he puts people on a, a, on a high pedestal. Um, and um, by doing that, you know, he like not easily trusts people, but it's just like very wise and, um, you know, like treat others the way you would want to be treated. And, um, you know, so many times my dad has, um, you know, given to the poor or, you know, um, gotten a meal for someone homeless or just like, you know, even dealing in the workplace, he's always just so kind to people. And, um, you know, he can make the worst situation just so much easier. Um, so, um, my dad was born in England. Um, he grew up between England and South America his whole life. Um, he came to the States um, when he was seven, when he was like 12, um, but always just back and forth. Um, he came from a very broken family. Um, so his dad um, raised him as an alcoholic, and um, eventually his parents divorced, and um, you know it's just very messy. And so at a very young age, my dad had to grow up very quickly. Um, he became basically the head of his whole family with his mom and his older brother and younger sister. Um, and so he didn't have a ton of support um, from the home base. Um, he worked for the State Department for a while, um, and then um, now he owns um, schools for kids with special for special needs and special education back in Northern Virginia. And um, you know, I guess just what I've learned from my dad is he, um, no matter how many hours he works at work, um, no matter how busy his day was, um, no matter how hard his day was, he always made it a point to come home and you know, give 110%. Um, I have a younger brother, my brother's nine, and um, so it's just really cool being able to look back on my life and think like, oh my gosh, like my dad is my best friend. Um, and, you know, but to be able to see him raising my brother um, in the same way. Um, so I guess just what I want you guys to take out of this, um, not to be more like my dad, um, you know, because I mean, no one's perfect. Um, but just to like treat others the way you would want to be treated and, um, and just to kind of find the best in people. Like you may um, have a hard time finding the best in others and whether you like them or not, but um, I mean the golden rule is to love everyone the way you would want to be loved and um, I think my dad really exemplified that. Thank you. 
Hannah's just a second. You guys finish up Hannah's.
elementary school that ran pre-K to 12th grade, so it was one of those. And it was extremely small. Like my graduating class was 35 kids in it total. And so it was kind of a type where everyone knew everyone, everyone knew everyone's business, whether they liked it or not, especially the drama. And for my class, like, we didn't really have that much drama, thankfully, until senior year hit. And so it was just like everything went down because everyone realized, you know, hey, like, I'm not going to see you after you graduate, so I have to say new stuff. So that wasn't exactly ideal, but uh, senior year was filled with drama, and it was a disappointing end of my soccer season. And I was in my class government as secretary, and that was drama filled too. And it was a lot of teachers that I used to appreciate, but then I kind of saw a different side to them, and so that was really disappointing and discouraging. And uh, so there were some ugly tears shed during senior year, but my mom was there to always as a shoulder to cry on and as a good advisor for anything, and just even if I needed to like vent too. So I'll be talking about my mom, and she's extremely like uh, caring about anyone and everyone, and like she never exactly got the opportunity to go to college because she was the oldest of four sisters so they didn't have the money to but if she had the opportunity she would have gone to psychology for counseling because she's just that type of person who anyone goes up to her and like just vents about anything and she's there to care for them like even if she doesn't even know them like in the grocery store and she's also um she too raised me as a single parent she was a full-time worker as a secretary since she was 16 years old uh, since she was 16 too, she didn't have the money for herself because it always went to her family to support them. And so that was hard for her. And she also is my number one supporter. She always has been there for me since day one. And uh, she's impacted me as well. Like just like we have deep talks and she helps me develop like further conviction on anything. And a uh, uh, not as big impact. So she's very organized, and so whenever like I'm gonna like, hang out with friends or something, she's gonna be like, okay, when are you leaving, where, when, who are you with? <laughs> and sometimes, you know, of course, it could be a little annoying, but I feel like because of that growing up, I'm kinda like that as well, which isn't always the best in college, but for some things, if they wanna be in the best for me, that's good. Um, and so she's always really thoughtful when it comes to other people and myself. Like she's the type who will just like randomly send care packages or something, uh, and just because she knows that it's gonna be like finals week or something like that. And she's definitely has the gift of acts of service for her love language. It's clearly shown whenever like she, our family needs something, she's always there to help out when on her own time, and especially when it comes to work as well. Like, a lot of times she'll be working under people who have no idea what they're doing, and they're making more money than her, but she'll still help them out and uh, kind of devote a lot of time to that. And she's very independent as well, which I really admire in her. And uh, sometimes she's a little too caring. So a lot of times, like when I first got my license, I'll be driving to school, and my school is 45 minutes from where I lived, so she'd always want me to text her as soon as I got there. And if I didn't, she'd turn into a worrier, kind of, because she cared too much. Because literally, like, one day I got to school, and I got two missed phone calls and four text messages from her, just because I forgot to text her that I got there safely. So it could be some pros and cons, but she's definitely someone who I admire because she's so thoughtful and caring for other people, and she's willing to put them first all the time. All right, 420, nice job. All right, take a second, finish up Rachel's, and Miss Sarah will get started in just a second.
And I loved it. And of course, at the end of every dance season, you have recital, right? So I'm there three. I'm not good. <laughs> I literally was falling all over the place. And my grandfather came to the recital with my grandmother and my other grandparents and my parents. And he was the type of person who, he was always very supportive, but he was also very honest and sometimes in a very, very rude way. So for the other kids that weren't good, he would be loud and saying, why is that fat kid up there dancing? And like that, yeah. <laughs> so after that, my grandfather wasn't allowed to come to my exercises anymore because my parents were very, very embarrassed. But he was still there because he always came to my uh, rehearsals. He would be there for just this specific time. They found out when my, my rehearsal would be. He would be sitting there, the only person out there watching. So he was there supporting me. And they kind of masked it with, oh, you, you should watch Daniel, which is my little brother. He's only, you know, one. You should go and watch him. He needs you kind of thing. But nonetheless, he was always there. So obviously, that's my grandfather. My granddad, Stan, who, this is him, doing something that's against the liberty way. <laughs> but this is when he was in his 20s. And the reason why I wanted to talk about him is long beyond just because I love him. He passed away when I was 10, um, and I miss him dearly. But also just he truly taught me how to be supportive of your family, how to show them that you love them. And that is something that I've always carried in my life, and I hope to emulate to others as well as like my future children and uh, so his, Stanley John Beers was born in 1928, November 13th, in Baltimore, Maryland. He is the product of um, the marriage of a Polish immigrant to an American. My, his father died when he was three months old in a, I want to say it was a shipyard accident. Where exactly he worked has kind of become murky over the years. But um, he was saving somebody else, a pipe had fallen, and he thrown somebody else out of the way. So he, in essence, was raised by a single mother until he was about five when she remarried to who my, my dad knows as his grandfather, who also passed away when my dad was little. Um, he then met my grandmother when he was in his 20s, before he went into the Army, uh, at a club, which not isn't the type of club we think of now. My grandmother was very adamant on letting me know that. Uh, he had a nickname with her group of friends as I pan out because he had this huge smile. He was very white which I kind of was a toothpaste if you're not familiar with that. We talked about it in the movie and musical Grease. Um, and they dated for a while, got married, had two kids, my Aunt Robin and my dad, and raised them wonderfully. They were, he wasn't a Christian. I don't think he actually became a Christian until very, very late in life. Something He was very, very prideful, so we would never have been told that. And it wasn't until after my dad became a Christian in his 20s that he was like really pushing on it. But after he passed away, my dad got this sense, he kind of heard his voice and said, take care of your mother, don't worry about me, Jesus is everything you've ever said he was and more, I'm okay, just take care of your mother. So that was, that's his early life, but the biggest impact he had on me is, like I said, he was always there for every single thing I did, whether he liked it or not. He obviously did not like dance, but he was there. He was far more of a sports person. He whether it was be just simply at my rehearsals or he was actually there. Right before, he was a, like I said, a big sports person. Baseball's huge in my family. I had just, it was right before, right after he passed away, I started playing softball. But nonetheless, he was there. And he, ever, there's a picture of me on my first birthday. He's holding me and he's the only person that could hold and held me all day. My mom tried to take me out of my grandfather's arm to start crying. I was also sick on my first birthday, so that's totally different side note, but nonetheless, he was there and he loved everyone. 